Good morning, Calvary Assembly. It is May 10th, 2020, and I am so grateful that you're connecting with us as we lean into worshiping the Lord, leaning into his presence, and gleaning and building upon his word. Romans chapter 8 is where we will find ourselves in just a few moments as Pastor David Welly, our teaching and missions pastor, leads us in a powerful message. I'm going to see you on the flip side with some exciting opportunities. I can't wait to share uh, ways that we can connect and grow as a church over the next few weeks. Also some timely updates just regarding our season. In the meantime, I've got to give a shout out to our moms. It's Mother's Day. Moms, we love you. I know our church family is full of godly women, women who love God and they demonstrate God's love and his faithfulness by extending his love to others, whether that be a biological relationship or you're a stand-in mom. And we love you. We thank God for you. We appreciate you. I give a shout out to my wife, Bridget, um, great mom to our three kids. And your mom, my mother-in-law, Gio, you're the best mother-in-law ever. But my mom, I want to just say happy Mother's Day. Mom, I love you. You are the sweetest. Uh, you have a heart of gold. Um, you have extended God's loving kindness to me and to so many other people in so many ways. Mom, you have set a trend for me to love God and love people. And I just want to thank you uh, for your faith and your faithfulness, Mom. Uh, your life has and continues to make an impact on me and, and many others. I love you so much this Mother's Day. So listen, moms, I wanted to share an encouraging thought with you. It's actually a devotional uh, daily guide post written by Karen Barber. She's a mom, and she's reflecting on a tender moment at her son's wedding. What an incredible moment that is if you're a parent out there when your kids uh, get married. And so she writes this, When Leah, our daughter-in-law-to-be, told me of plans of the wedding reception, she mentioned there would be a special time when, as the mother of the groom, I would dance with our son Jeff. At first, I thought, oh, no, not me out there on the dance floor with everyone watching. But as the time approached, I began to look forward to the dance. How special to have a few minutes with Jeff at the reception. Perhaps the last few moments I'd spend with him before they would be off on their honeymoon and settling into their new home in Colorado. I imagined the profound and wonderful things I might say to Jeff during those moments. The wedding festivities went by in a blur. Finally, the time came for our dance as I reached up to my son's tall shoulder and he grasped my right hand. All of the things I'd planned to say to him evaporated. Instead, I found myself asking with concern. I noticed you've been so busy. You haven't eaten. Aren't you hungry? I haven't eaten all day, he admitted, but it's okay. They're putting together a basket of food from the reception for us. They'll put it in the car. We'll take it with us. Looking down at his shoes, I asked, do your feet hurt? No, they're fine, he answered. Soon the dance was over and my friend Charlene was eager to discover what Jeff and I had been chatting about on the dance floor. And I repeated the conversation and I laughed. Out there on the dance floor, I had asked my 23-year-old son, who was an Air Force officer and a brand new husband, if he was hungry or if his feet hurt. I sat down and took off my own too tight shoes then reconsidered my seemingly wasted opportunity. Perhaps it had been just right after all. During that dance, I had unconsciously performed my last act of mothering by revisiting my first. When our children are newborns, our questions are always, are they hungry? Are they hurt? And as they grow, these questions grow into prayers that fit each new stage of their lives. God fill them and comfort them. What an ins inspirational article. Oh, moms, some of you have married off your kids and you can relate. I want to pray for you, moms. I want to thank God for you, for the way that you have, you have extended God's provision and his comfort to your children, to your grandchildren, and to anyone God's brought your way. I want to ask God to bless you in return. Heavenly Father, I thank you for not only my mom, my mother-in-law, my wife, but all of our moms. I thank you for the blessing they are. I thank you that your Holy Spirit has quickened them to extend your love, your faithfulness to us, to so many. Now, God, as they have been an extension of your hand and blessing, I ask God that you would bless them today. Lord, that you would extend comfort back to them today. Lord, that you would that you would supply their every need as they have aimed to supply the needs of others. Bless them today. Faith, hope, and love. Fill their hearts today. Replenish their hearts today so they can be a blessing to others. 
And we give you praise for all of our moms and our stand-in moms today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
the beginning of time, God has been blessing his children. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created man in his own image. And the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. The very first thing he did for his children was to call a blessing upon them. And then we see Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. And then God again calls Aaron and says, Bless my people. And this was the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And that's my prayer today, is that you have peace. The peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. Be blessed. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming. 
He is for you. 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 pray. Father, thank you this day that we can come to you, that you, who are the source of the blessings we've just heard sung about, would cause your face to shine on us as we listen to your word this morning. Pray, Lord, that you'll open our hearts, that you'll help us to hear and receive, believe, and apply your word. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it is good to be with you this morning. I get the privilege of sharing God's word. Haven't done that in a while, and it's just a pleasure. I'm sorry we're not face to face, but we look forward to that happening before too long. I love a good cliffhanger of a story. You know, the kind that suspends you over the edge of the cliff and then threatens to drop you. Well, my daughter Alyssa and I recently saw a cliffhanger of a movie called 1917. It's about a particular British regiment that is prepared and ready to make an assault against the enemy on the assumption that the enemy seems to be retreating. But British reconnaissance, some distance away from the regiment, discovers that that retreat is a deception. It's in fact an attempt to entice that regiment into what would become a killing zone. The generals, of course, want to alert the regiment not to make that assault, but they have a problem. They can't communicate in any way with that regiment. There's no radio, there's no other air, no airplane communication. The only thing they can do is send two low-ranking soldiers across eight miles of any enemy-infested, uncharted land to see if they can, by chance, make it to that regiment and prevent the assault. Well, they send them off, and that's the only hope, is that these two men will get the message in time 
to avert this disaster. It's a cliffhanger. Will they make it? How's this all going to end? Will the message arrive and prevent the massacre? Well, I'm not going to spoil the end of the movie. You can watch it, perhaps. You could also probably guess how it ends. Well, cliffhangers in movies are pretty entertaining. But cliffhangers in life are not at all the same. We are not entertained. We don't find them fun at all because cliffhangers in life stir up fear and distress, anxiety, and all those sort of negative things that we'd rather avoid. Well, you know, we've kind of recently been in a cliffhanger moment. We have this COVID-19 crisis that, yes, has brought to us some fear and some uncertainty, some tensions and challenges that we didn't anticipate and aren't finding fun at all. I'm certainly glad that God is being faithful. I know faithful to me, I'm sure faithful to you. Nevertheless, we are enduring this time. I am so glad today to bring a little bit of good news. This is this. The Christian life is not a cliffhanger life. There's no cliffhanging living for the Christian. The reality is that in the passage we're going to look at, we will receive assurance that there is uh, God's grace, God's blessing, God's provision, and yes, a destiny and an end to which God infallibly is leading us. There is good news ahead. Now, this passage of Scripture is one of the most famous passages in all the Bible. Um, someone, John Piper, in fact, has called it the Great Eight. Martin Luther referred to this passage and called it the clearest gospel of all. A contemporary uh, commentator by the name of Douglas Moo has called this chapter of Scripture the inner sanctuary within the cathedral of the Christian faith. They are talking about Romans 8. Probably the best chapter in the New Testament, or at least in my opinion. But it's one of those rare places where you have this amazing interweaving of the ugly and inescapable realities of sin and suffering, woven tightly with the most amazing assurances of salvation and of final victory. Romans 8, in fact, is so rich with truth that not only are we going to survey it today, but we're going to begin next Sunday a series of four messages based on Romans 8 under the title, If. And the reason we're using that word, if, it's about both the title of a book that we're going to rely on, but it also is because the, the word, if, appears repeatedly in that chapter and brings us truths like this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, you'll hear more about that series before the end of this morning. Um, today, what we're going to see in Romans 8 is this. We're going to see God's goal for believers. We're going to see God's provisions to get us to that goal. And we're going to see the confidence that will carry us all the way. So God's goal, God's provision, and our confidence all in Romans chapter 8. You may want to open your Bible to Romans 8 as we go forward. Now we're going to start our look at this chapter in what I think to be the heart of the passage uh, verses 28 through 30. And if you've read this famous chapter, you know that it concludes on this crescendo of, of assurance, this crescendo of, of faith and of victory. And what precipitates that crescendo are the promises found in these three verses. So I'm going to read Romans 28. It says this, And we know that in all these things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might become the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. The spark for Paul's climactic enthusiasm at the end of that chapter are these very promises. And we find actually a summary of everything we're going to talk about today. They summarize both God's goal and God's provisions to bring us to that goal. God's goal to transform us, uh, to bring all of his children into glory. I'm going to say it in the one word Paul uses, God's goal 
is glorification. And then God's provision to work all things in life for the God-glorifying good of his people. Now, as we go on, we're going to unpack those realities for the rest of the chapter, but that's the summary of what we're going to say. Before we look at the rest of the chapter, though, I want us to catch the essentials of this brief portion of Scripture. God, all it says is this, God calls people to Christ, they respond to this call with love, and then he calls, and those he calls, that is, he determines to transform into the image of his now glorified Son. And Paul boils down all these initiatives into a linked chain of divine actions. Here's how he says it. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And this unbreakable chain is Paul's cause for the deep assurance and the rich enthusiasm that follows. What God starts, he carries on to completion. Now, I know you've probably thought about what it means to be justified before. Most of you are not new to this Christian thing. It's a familiar word. You might have heard it explained like this. To be justified is to be made righteous by God, just as if you had never sinned, okay? To be justified is to have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us as an act of sheer mercy and grace on God's part. The gospel message is this, that Jesus lived the life we ought to have lived. He died the death we ought to have died. And on the basis of his sacrifice, God imputes to us Jesus' own righteousness. God makes ungodly sinners righteous when they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Believers are justified. Okay, so you know that. You've thought about it. That's a brief summary of it. Well, we're less familiar with the second portion of that uh, chain that I read, and that is this idea of being glorified. What does it mean to be glorified? Well, obviously from the word itself, you can see being glorified means to be made glorious. Um, and maybe we can look at the experience of Christ to discover what this might mean for us. Um, just before Jesus was arrested, just before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed a simple prayer. We find it in John chapter 17, verse 5. Here's what he prayed. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus is asking the Father to be restored to his pre-incarnate glory the glory he had in inter eternity before he took on human form. Well, what was that like? Well, we get a glimpse of this, of this Jesus' inherent glory, when he invites Peter and James and John to walk with him up a mountain. And while praying there, his face uh, takes on a brightness like lightning. His clothing becomes as white as white could be, radiant white. And he emanates with this radiance of his inherent glory. Uh, this is the glory that was his in heaven, was enclosed in flesh and, and hidden most of the time, but in this particular incident, it is uncovered on earth and it radiates and dazzles those three apostles. With this simple prayer, Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you, Jesus is asking to be imbued and enveloped again, he's anticipating heaven, with the glory he had in heaven before he left. The Father does answer this prayer, as of course you would imagine. The Son of God asks, God answers. And he does so by sustaining him through the suffering of the crucifixion, by rising from the dead, giving him a resurrection body, and then uh, in 40 days, causing him to ascend, 10 days, excuse me, causing him to ascend to heaven. No, 40 days later, excuse me. And uh, so by his resurrection and by his ascension, Jesus is restored to his original heavenly glory. Now, something we need to know, that Jesus' resurrection and ascension not only moved him from heaven, but they vindicated Jesus' holiness and purity. That is, it was the resurrection that declared 
Jesus to be the Son of God, perfectly holy. Uh, Romans chapter 1 tells us that, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Um, but, but reality is that his resurrection reveals that Jesus was embodied a perfect righteousness, a perfect holiness, an inner righteousness that was humanly unattainable, but which was his as the Son of God. He was the embodiment of goodness and beauty and truthfulness and holiness. Now, Jesus' experience in the garden there and in life is a pattern, I think, of what it means for one of his followers to be glorified. All believers will be similarly imbued with the glory of God. We will all radiate as Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, as he did, because we too will be glorified. We will have glorified bodies, and we will have the same holiness of character. That same glory will imbue us on the inside so that we will reflect the same goodness and beauty and truthful and truthfulness and rightness. Uh, John the Apostle described it this way. He says, we will see him, and when we see him, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. We will be like Jesus, glorified in, in Christ. Now, here's how C.S. Lewis describes it. He has such perfect words, I want to quote him. Here's what he says. God will make the feeblest and filthy of us into, into a god or a goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. Believers will radiate the glory of God. But we're not only going to shine forth with this glory, um, the, the, the word glory points to something else. It also points to the idea of fame, being widely recognized and lavishly affirmed. So when people lavishly affirm you, you are being glorified in a human sense. Uh, the trouble with this is we usually see seeking fame as a selfish thing. And of course, that's usually what it is. I mean, if, if, we want to, uh, if we want to seek fame for the praise it brings us, that's badly motivated. But of course, whether seeking accolades is selfish or not depends on whose praise you are seeking and why you seek it, okay? Um, if we want accolades from other humans in order to feel good about their souls, no doubt our pride will go to work and we'll turn that into something ugly and corrupting. Um, you know, we kind of think we deserve it. <laughs> um, but if it is God who gives the accolades, and if we receive those accolades humbly, as a very little child might receive the authentic affirmation of a parent, then we are experiencing something eternal and beautiful and enduring. Um, and, and really, this is exactly what Jesus has in mind when he, in the parable, he, he said, then the master will say to the servant, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. That moment, the moment when God approves us is a moment of glorification such as we cannot experience entirely and fully here on earth, but which will, which will bring a sort of glory that we can barely imagine right now. Imagine this. We will be a real ingredient in the pleasure of God. We will constitute in God's heart genuine pleasure to him. And that is almost unimaginably glorious. So, Everybody who believes in Christ, Paul says, Paul guarantees, who is justified will be glorified. They're going to be imbued and enveloped with God's glory. They're going to emanate 
that glory from a purity and a holiness within that's like the holiness of Christ. And everyone who is in Christ will be affirmed by God himself, whose affirmation alone forever puts to rest our fears of rejection, our proud strivings to be significant, our quiet, ceaseless anxiety over our worth. God's well done will put that all to rest. Believers are going to be glorified. And in that glorified state, believers are going to inherit the new heaven, the new earth, uh, finally merged together. There's going to be no more mourning or crying or sickness and pain. COVID-19 will be forever banished. I can't wait. I hope you can too. Well, God's goal is the glorification of believers. Now, we've got to think about just a little bit. So what are God's provisions to bring his children into this glory? And of course, Romans 8 lays them out for us. What provisions will God make for this? And, 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 and we're going to really quickly summarize through Romans 8, 1 through 27. I'm just going to mention four things. I'm going to mention that God brings us to glory through atonement, through indwelling, through adoption and assistance. First of all, through atonement. We talked about justification. Justification is based on the atoning work of Christ. Paul starts the chapter by saying, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so, he condemned sin in sinful man. God atoned for the sins that we have committed. There will, therefore, because of Christ, for those who believe in Jesus, there will be no guilty verdict. There will be no eternal doom because Jesus came, offered himself up as a sin offering, and he condemned sin for us. Believers in Jesus escape the condemnation that we otherwise deserve for failing to obey God's law, all right? So, atonement. And God brings us to glory by indwelling with the Holy Spirit. Here's how Paul puts it. You, however, he says, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. Everyone who believes in Christ receives the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And that indwelling spirit enables us to overcome the bondage we otherwise suffer to sin. Paul goes on to say in verse 12, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature, brothers, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. So as you see, by the indwelling Holy Spirit, believers are able to live lives of righteousness, peace, and joy. We are able to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law by showing, by loving God authentically, by loving other people genuinely, and by increasingly finding the ability to do God's will. Never perfectly, but increasingly and actually. God brings us to glory by by, by, by indwelling and by adoption. Believers receive the Holy Spirit and he testifies in our hearts that we are God's adopted children. Here's what it says. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit that God gives us awakens in our heart a cry, Abba, Father, you are my Father in heaven. I am your child, and I feel so close to you, I would even call you Daddy. That's the implication of that word, Abba. And, uh, and, and so, the, the, the Spirit does for us what the Spirit did for Jesus at his baptism. You'll remember a voice from heaven spoke to him saying, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit day after day repeats that essential message to all of God's children. If we're listening, we'll hear the Spirit saying, You belong to me. You are mine. I am pleased with you. 
you are my adopted child. And the Spirit testifies to us that we belong to God, that we're loved by God, and he does for us what he did for Christ. He empowers us to go about doing God's will. So these three provisions are what's laid out in the first 16 verses of Romans chapter 8. They're simply this. There's no condemnation to judgment. There's no bondage to sin. There's no fear-based living any longer. Um, God's Spirit bears witness with us about these things, and there's nothing but glory in the end. That's what verse 17 says. Here's how Paul puts it. If you are children, then you are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Remember, all who are justified are glorified. Glory is guaranteed in the end. But this chapter goes on to remind us that we're approaching glory in the midst of a world of suffering and our glory our pursuit of glory must confront the daily reality of suffering in a fallen world. And that brings us to God's last provision here in these final verses, and that is he assists us, God's provision of divine help. Remember that our fallen world, suffering under Adam's sin, was cursed, was subjected to frustration by God in anticipation of a future when all creation will share with God's own children the freedom and the glory in store for his children. The children will be glorified, creation will be liberated at the same time. But in the meantime, creation and God's children are groaning. We're groaning as in the pains of childbirth, and God gives two forms of help. I'm summarizing a whole lot here, but it is very simple. He provides us with hope for a resurrection and the help of the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us and through us. So God assists us by giving us hope for a resurrection and the help of the Spirit who actually prays for us and within us. Well, so God is going to bring us to glory. How? By providing us with atonement, indwelling, adoption, and assistance and then he's going to provide us with a confidence that will carry us to our goal. And because this is so poetic and I could never do it justice, I'm going to simply read to you Paul's words, uh, Romans 8, starting with verse 31. I'm not reading quite to the end of the chapter, but listen to these words of assurance. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's not quite the end of the verse, we're, chapter. We're going to get there. But think with me just a moment. Who can condemn God's children? No one. God has justified them in Christ. Jesus has been raised to dead. Jesus is from the dead is interceding for them. There's no one who can throw condemnation at a child of God. And what can separate us from Christ's love? Who or what can separate us from, life's, from, from Christ's love? Not hardship, not persecution, not famine not even COVID-19. Though it looks like these things are, are wearing us down, even killing us, they are not the end of the story. We overcome all these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that's how Paul and I both conclude. 
with these incredible words of Paul's assurance and our assurance as followers of Christ, we will be glorified and we will bring or we will come to that destination under this assurance. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the good news. God has a goal for us, and that's glory. He's made provisions for us that are totally sufficient, and our confidence is this. We will be more than conquerors through him who loved us. God is faithful. Let's put our hope in him today. Would you pray with me? Father, we do pray that, Lord, these words of assurance will lift our hearts, will eliminate from us the sense that in any way we're in a cliffhanger of a life. Instead, Lord, we know you've gone before us and you've guaranteed this glory. We pray that you'll enable us today to both trust in you, to look to you for the provisions we've reviewed, and to rest in the confidence that we have in the one who's loved us with an unfading, unfailing love. We pray that you would strengthen us in Jesus our Lord, and in his name we pray. Amen. You know, uh, right now, we're going to take just a moment to watch a little preview of the series that we're going to start next Sunday. And I want you to know that not only are we going to have sermons, we're going to have sermon-based small groups, growth groups. And this week, you're going to give uh, some communication on our website and our midweek email update and a dedicated email sent to you, God willing, you're on our mailing list, that will invite you to join one of our groups. I hope you will do that. I hope you will uh, respond to those invitations and join one of our online small groups that will start uh, sometime on uh, May 17th or shortly thereafter. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. The Lord be with you. Amen. What's your what if? If you stop and think about it, everything begins with if. One little if can change everything. One little if can change anything. If God is for us, then who can be against us? And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I have a simple theory. It's bold predictions backed up by bold actions that changes the course of history, that changes the trajectory of our lives. You were once an idea in the mind of Almighty God. You are God's what if. So here's the question. What's your what if? What is your one God idea? What's your God-sized dream or your God-ordained passion? God is ordering your footsteps. He's preparing good works in advance. And the God who began a good work in you, he will carry it to completion. Our only regrets at the end of our lives will be the time, the talent, and the treasure that we left on the table that we didn't give back to God. Those will be the if-onlys that will haunt us to the grave and beyond. I'm convinced of this. When everything is said and done, all that matters is hearing God say, well done, good and faithful servant.
That video trailer gets me so excited about where I believe God has us going, church, over the next several weeks as we launch into a brand new series, If, focus in on Romans chapter 8. Pastor David, thank you so much for elevating the biblical theological truths found there. We're going to be supplementing uh, our primary resources, the Bible, Romans 8, but our supplemental resource is going to be Mark Batterson's book titled If. I hope you've got a copy. If you haven't, please hop online, find a resource. They're usually $10 to $15. Some people are finding them free through their free through their library uh, and their audio resources that you can listen to. That's also perhaps a route you, you might want to take. But we are really pumped. Our pastors and leaders, listen, church, we have been praying for this season for months. In fact, since 2019, we believe that God was going to bring us to a point to think about the what-if possibilities that God has in store for you and for me and the church of Calvary Assembly of God. He's not called us just to coast. He's not just called us to kind of, you know, kind of drift our way to the finish line. Uh, but in these end times, we believe that God is cultivating Calvary Assembly of God to be workers in the end time harvest. We want to be productive. May his kingdom come and his will be done in our hearts, in our homes, in our lives, in and through the church. And so this this if series helps us evaluate not only where we've where we've been but where God is bringing us not only by his grace but by his spirit's power the what if possibilities that God has for us you know he's called us to be fishers of men makers of disciples and so we believe that during this season this upcoming series as we focus in on the truths found in Romans chapter 8 and we read this practical resource by Mark Batterson that the Holy Spirit is going to cultivate our hearts our minds he's going to kind of get us off of home base get us off of ground zero kind of help us step out of the boat in terms of our faith we believe God's going to begin to open our eyes to the what if possibilities that he has for you and me and Calvary Assembly of God. So I hope you'll get a copy of this resource. I hope that you will lean in. Look, we're going to bring uh, this emphasis on Sunday mornings, uh, but we're also, man, look, I'm hoping that every one of you, church, will, will get a copy of this book, read some chapters every week, fix your heart on Romans chapter 8, pray, and then lean into a discussion group through Zoom. Okay, so we're going to have discussion groups every week in multiple ways, different days, 45 to 60 minutes. You can lean in. You can connect with a smaller group, maybe it'd be eight or 10 people thereabouts, and you can discuss Sunday sermon, what you've read, and uh, and allow the Holy Spirit to, to cultivate the conversation and your heart, and you can pray together. And it's going to be a rich time, I'm telling you. So uh, Zoom has been a gift to the church during this season. Zoom, if you've not done so yet, please start connecting with our digital groups. By the way, uh, you obviously are tuned in, so you've got some technological ability. But there are people in the church family who do, do they don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have a smartphone. They'll say, oh, I've got a dumb phone. Here, here's the deal. Listen. I'm hoping that everyone that's listening today, everyone that's going to lean in and grow with us as we connect through this series, that you will contact three, four, five different people in the church and invite them and encourage them to not only get a copy of this book and to read Romans chapter 8, if nothing else, that, but then to also connect to our digital groups. Now, we're going to be sending out some resources as to how to do that. You know, keep your ears, keep your eyes open to that over the next week. Uh, but again, People think, well, I don't have a, a smartphone or a device where I can connect and, and see people. Listen, here's the deal. You can actually connect with our digital groups like a, like a conference call. You don't even need a smartphone or internet. You need to let people know this. There's going to be a phone number they can call to connect to each digital group. And they can use a landline. They can call. They can plug in the meeting ID number, and they can connect. They can listen. They can hear the voices of those eight or ten people in that group. They can be part of the prayer. They can grow as we connect together. So I want to be sure that people know that spread the word we're hoping that everyone will have 100 percent participation in this series because we believe it's that important our leaders have literally been praying for a year for this time and we believe that god's going to cultivate our hearts and set the stage for us to begin to unfold what we believe god is giving us a god-sized vision for calvary assembly of god so church i'm asking you uh, please pray with us please uh, please lean in and uh, let's do this thing together now listen in the meantime uh, know this. We miss you. I miss you. Uh, there's no place like the church home. I miss worshiping with you. I, I miss elevating his praise together with you. I, I miss being still and knowing that he is God in the room. I miss the spiritual gifts. I, I miss the tongues and interpretation and edificational moments. I miss praying with and for the body of Christ in the same room. I, I miss you. We miss you. We do. 
But your health and your wellness is our number one priority. Look, this pastor is not going to steer you prematurely into harm's way. That's not my intention. And we are praying for godly wisdom. Pray with us. Look, I want to thank the seven leaders who make up our advisory team, our regather advisory team. They're taking in resources and information and they're advising the pastors, advising the staff, advising our deacons so that we can make an educated decision in terms of how we'll do ministry when we do come back together at, the, at an appropriate time. In the meantime, what we're doing right now is we are gleaning from our, our primary leaders and our volunteers who minister on Sunday mornings. We can't do ministry ever without those folks, right? So right now we are asking them, we sent them a questionnaire. They're sending us some information in terms of their levels of comfort and when they are comfortable coming back. And some of them, maybe they shouldn't be coming back. They need to kind of stay healthy and whole themselves. And maybe they're a little more vulnerable. And uh, so we're, we're taking in that information. And then your input, church, is very important to us. So in the next week or two, you're going to receive an email from the church uh, sharing a little bit of a vision in terms of some of the possibilities. And we're going to ask you some questions. We're going to send you a questionnaire. I hope you'll fill that out promptly and honestly. And again, we know we can't please everybody. Uh, we, and we can't protect everybody. But we want to do our very best um, in terms of ministering in a way that we believe is God-honoring and respectful of you and your well-being. So pray for us along those lines. In the meantime, I hope to catch you in a dis discussion group online somewhere this week. And I hope to see you again next weekend as we launch our series, If Trading in Our If Only Regrets for God's What If Possibilities.